why don't modern F1 cars look anything like the old? We're back once again with the Why Don't series. If you've missed any of the other ones, such as Why Don't F1 Cars Have Airbags, or more recently the Why Don't F1 Cars Have Brake Lights, be sure to check them out in the description below. So anyway, I was sitting there, relaxing one evening, when I thought about how much F1 cars have changed over the years. And it got me wondering, why are the cars they used to race back in the 50s so much different to the ones we see now? In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the major changes that have contributed to the evolution of the F1 car. Let's start at the very beginning, the start of the F1 World Championship in 1950. If you're a tech novice, like me, then the first thing you'll notice is that the front is longer than the back. Well, that's because for the first eight years, F1 cars ran their engines in the front of the car like any normal road car does. That was until engineers worked out that placing the engine in the rear allows for more favourable weight distribution and therefore more mechanical grip and in turn, faster lap times. No surprise that a rear engine car, Cooper, won the championship in 1959. In 1963, the first fully stressed monocoque chassis was created and where, in my opinion, we start to see little remnants of the Formula 1 cars we know and love today. The drivers were made to sit extremely low to the ground as keeping the centre of gravity as low as possible was ideal for cornering and was hence given the bathtub nickname. In general, the cars in the 60s looked relatively similar. That was until the F1 team started to come up with all sorts of crazy inventions for creating downforce. Aerodynamics wasn't really a thing back when F1 first started. So much so, Enzo Ferrari famously once said, aerodynamics are for people who can't build engines. The cars were all made to have as little drag as possible and this was coined under the term streamlining. Most of the F1 team's attention went into building the fastest, most powerful engine possible. But as aerodynamic understanding began to become apparent at the end of the 60s, we finally saw the first rear wing in 1968 on the Lotus Ford Cosworth. However, the engineers put the wings in such ridiculous and dangerous positions that the sport quickly intervened to regulate the wing sizes. The end of the 60s also saw the fuel tank move to the side pods. If you're looking for a year in this timeline where we can definitively say that this was the turning point towards modern day F1 cars, I'd say it has to be Colin Chapman's Lotus 72 from 1970. This car included side mounted radiators as opposed to nose mounted radiators, which meant the addition of side pods as well as a much narrower front of the car, much more like what we're used to seeing today. A pretty crazy time dawned upon us for the 1976 season when Tyrrell rolled out their Formula 1 car with six wheels slapped on the car. And funnily enough, it actually succeeded for one season before rule changes made it uncompetitive. Can you see where I'm going with this video? There are loads of factors to take into account as to why the F1 cars look so different now to back then. Generally speaking, there were many minor changes in the 70s as aerodynamics were at the forefront of many team engineers' minds, and with that, we saw huge variants of designs. One of the biggest innovations was the Lotus car in 1978 that utilised what is called ground effect. In a nutshell, Lotus made the underbody of their F1 car in such a way that Mario Andretti said it felt like it was painted to the road. They achieved this by essentially turning the entire car into a large inverted wing which led to airflow going under the car and sucking the car into the ground. This clever concept was banned in 1982 as it made the F1 cars much too fast. In the 1980s there were obviously still lots of changes and we'd be here for three hours if I went through all of them. McLaren in the early 80s came up with what is known as the coke bottle shape which gave a big advantage aerodynamically and you can bet every single team soon copied them. Gordon Murray also came up with an aerodynamic solution to the engine boost limitation that had been set by the FIA in 1987, essentially enabled the driver to get much lower in the car. He then moved to McLaren for 1988 and helped to create one of the most dominant F1 cars of all time, the MP4-4. Ferrari changed the game once more in 1989 with the invention of the paddle shifter, which tightened the nose up exponentially due to having one less pedal down by the driver's feet. And you guessed it, everyone copied them. From here on in, you can sort of say the cars haven't changed a huge amount. We've had 2005 where there were incredibly distinctive winglets on the car, 2008 the inclusion of a shark fin, 2012 with the very ugly step nose, 2014 with, well, you can guess what they were called, but all of these were quite minor in the grand scheme of F1 history. The only one I can truly say is distinguishable would be the introduction of the Halo in 2018, putting an end to the era of open cockpit F1. After the horrific news of Jules Bianchi's passing after a crash at the 2014 Japanese Grand Prix, the FIA mandated that all F1 cars be fitted with the Halo device to further protect the driver. 
and we've already seen it do an incredible job quite a few times already. There you have it, a dive into why old F1 cars look nothing like the modern day ones. What else would you like to be answered in this Why Don't series? Let us know in the comments section below.